Thanks so much for joining me this week as we go into our final installment in our Habits of Grace series. Um, you could say we saved the best for last this week. We're going to be talking about embracing the blessing of rebuke. And maybe some of you are hearing that and thinking, this is going to be an interesting uh, study. And uh, I hope that you will find it very challenging and encouraging as we go through this together. Before we jump in, I just want to briefly review what we've been talking about in our series so far. We've really talked about these three different habits of grace. Having God's ear, that is the, our ability to pray. Uh, hearing God's voice, having his word and then also being a part of his body, what it means to be in the fellowship of believers. If you remember, we talked about what that really has to do with this idea of koinonia, that is partnership together. And last week specifically, our lesson was on listening and speaking in the body. And you remember that when we talked about speaking, one of the crucial elements is speaking to build up. This week, we're going to really take that to the next level as we talk about this idea of rebuke. Now, I don't know about you, but when I think about rebuke, I don't usually have a really positive connotation. Probably most of us cringe a little bit when we think about rebuke or kind of you can get that, that knot down in the pit of your stomach as you think about the possibility of either being rebuked by someone or needing to be rebuked. Um, really, conflict is something that most of us don't look forward to. And you might be thinking, well, isn't that, isn't that your job, Pastor Ben? You're the pastor. Don't you, you professionals have to go do that? And the reality that we're going to see here is that's part of the responsibility of all of us of being a part of the body of believers, both to receive reproof and rebuke from one another and to graciously give that. So what does that look like? What does the Bible tell us about it? Well, um, first of all, I want to ask the question, rebuke, is it good or is it bad? You know, most of us would agree that conflict is uncomfortable. We don't tend to run to conflict. We tend to run from conflict. Now, that's not true for all of us. Some people like conflict, but oftentimes it can be for the wrong reason. And so it's really important for us uh, to recognize that rebuke is really a great act of love. That may sound like a strange statement, but even though we don't often see it this way, um, it takes a lot of love and care for somebody um, to actually take the time to intentionally uh, come to somebody and confront them about an area of sin in their life and to rebuke them on that. So I want to take a look at what does it mean to receive the gift of rebuke? We're going to talk first of all about receiving rebuke and then about giving rebuke and what the Bible says about that. So how should we respond when somebody approaches us and comes to us with a rebuke? Again, we really have to remember that the easiest path is usually the one of silence and indifference, right? Think about it. How many times do you see somebody doing something, a brother or sister in Christ, and you think, oh man, that's just not right, but I know I'm probably going to really offend them if I talk about that, or maybe they won't want, to talk about, won't want to talk to me, or we'll just think, what, are you better than me, right? And so we think, man, there's just so many things that could go wrong. I really don't want to take and engage this conflict right now. It's, it's going to be awkward, right? But what we need to recognize is that good reproof and even sometimes bad reproof that's done reportedly is done out of a desire of love and care for someone. So even though you may not feel it, if somebody comes to rebuke you, you need to, our first posture needs to be gratefulness, to thank them for their willingness to do that. You know, there's too much to go over in detail, all the different places in the Bible that talk about rebuke. Um, but I want to just highlight a few in Proverbs and talk about the importance of how we respond to rebuke and what it says about who we are. Because how we respond to rebuke says a lot about who we are. So here are a few examples, okay? And we're going to start by looking at the one who rejects reproof or rebuke, okay? So Proverbs 10, 17 says that this person leads others astray. Proverbs 12.1 says this person who rejects reproof is stupid. Another passage, Proverbs 15.5 says, if you reject rebuke, you're a fool. Fifth, Proverbs 15.32 says, you despise him, or he despises himself who rejects reproof. It also says in Proverbs 15.10 that whoever hates a reproof will die. And lastly, Proverbs 13.18 says, poverty and disgrace come upon him who hates a rebuke. So recognize, you know, look at that picture that's painted there. It may feel natural to us to reject re reproof and rebuke, but the Bible has some pretty strong words to say we're stupid if we do that. 
Um, and so it's not a good thing. It's not the right posture. Let's look on the other side of the coin, though. Proverbs also has a lot of words to say about those who embrace a rebuke. Here's what it says. The one who re- embraces a, re- a rebuke is honored, is what Proverbs 13, 18 says. Is prudent, is what Proverbs 15, 5 says. Gains intelligence, Proverbs 15, 32. Loves knowledge, Proverbs 12, 1. And will dwell among the wise, Proverbs 15, 31. And is on the path of life, Proverbs 10, 17. You know, think about it. How do you want to find yourself described as someone who's a fool, uh, who is destined for death, Or do you want to be among the wise, someone who's honored, gains intelligence, and is on the path of life? So recognize the importance of how we respond to rebuke. Pause for a second right there. If that's not convicting you, just let that sink in. For me, as I study this passage, I found this very, very convicting truth. Okay? So receiving the gift of rebuke. The other thing we want to see is that when we're rebuked by a brother or sister, we need to be hearing God's voice in our brother's rebuke. Now, what do I mean by that? Well, we need to think about the fact that we should be thankful for a rebuke, even if the delivery is poor. I don't know about you, but it's really easy for me to say, man, they, what they said might have been right, but I mean, why did they come to me right now? Don't they know what a terrible time this is? Or uh, the tone was just totally wrong. That was not appropriate. Or you know, look, why did you say it that way? If you would have said it this way, maybe I would have been more open, but, uh, you know, when you said it that way, that just ticked me off, right? The, the motivation even could seem wrong. Yeah, you might be right in what you're saying, but I feel like you're just saying it to put me down or because you want to prove that you're right and that I'm wrong, whatever it is, right? Maybe, maybe you can fill in the blank with some other responses that you have in your heart when somebody comes to you, uh, to, to correct you. I know those are just some of the things that I often feel. But we need to remember that the heart of a rebuke is oriented around helping us become more like Jesus. And if that's the heart of it, if that's what's underneath it, even if it comes out completely wrong, we need to ransack that rebuke for every grain of truth. And we need to repent of those things that we've sinned in and thank God for pouring out his grace on us through that rebuke. Proverbs 3, 11 through 12 says this, My son, do not despise the Lord's discipline or be weary of his reproof. For the Lord reproves him who he loves as a father, the son in whom he delights. Discipline and reproof are always God, are, are ways that God shows us his love. So we need to recognize that if we are being reproved by someone, that this is a way that God is demonstrating his love to us even if it doesn't feel that way in the, at the time. Maybe it doesn't feel comfortable. Um, so the question I would ask is, how does God most often rebuke us? I think the answer to that is, most often he rebukes us through the voice of one of our brothers and sisters in Christ. So God speaks through brothers and sisters in Christ to help correct us, to train us. Maybe it's your parents. Maybe it's one of your siblings. Maybe it's just a friend who comes to you and says, hey, why are you doing this? It's not consistent with what God's word is. And so when we hear a rebuke, a rebuke that's founded on scripture and that is oriented toward wanting to see us become more like Jesus, regardless of how the delivery is, do we stop and think, this is God rebuking me through Uh, through this person. That should be the attitude that we need to have. The other thing I want you to see from this passage in Proverbs here is that we need to remember who we are. You know what the challenge is? That when somebody comes to us and tells us we're doing something wrong, we take it personally, right? I know this is really true for me. I'm quick to defend why I wasn't really that wrong or it really wasn't that big of a deal or whatever the things that we may have a tendency to say are. But at the core of it, what I feel like is you're saying I'm a bad person and I'm not really that bad of a person. Let me tell you why. Um instead of having a heart that is humble. Here's what I want you to see. At those moments when we feel like people are are judging us and are condemning us and in our, our defensiveness and our pride rises to the surface, we need to stop and remember who we are. Look at uh, verse 12 for me. It says, For the Lord reproves him who he loves as a father, the son in whom he delights. Now, even though this is written back long before Jesus came to be on the earth, what we need to recognize is that God has accepted us as his beloved children because of Jesus. 
There's nothing we can do to earn God's favor. There's nothing we can do to be good enough to be accepted as his children. But when God looks at us, he sees the perfect obedience of Jesus. And Jesus has taken away the filth and the shame of our sin so that that is no longer the way we approach God. We don't have to, like Adam and Eve, try to hide to cover our sin. We can be open with our sin and know that God I know this is wrong, and I'm so thankful that you see me as you see Jesus, that you see his perfect obedience in my place. And so when someone comes to us to rebuke us, and we have that tendency to become defensive, this is the time where we need to stop and remember who we are. God, I know you love me and have accepted me. Not because I'm a good person, not because I deserve it, but because of Jesus. And when we remember that, we need to know that our identity isn't going to be shaken by the rebuke that we're receiving. And instead, we can embrace that rebuke, uh, recognizing that it it is intended to help make us more like Jesus. So let's take a look at what the basis for rebuke is. I want to look at 2 Timothy 3, 16 through 17, as we, we kind of think about What's what does a loving rebuke look like? And and by the way, what's the difference between a, a rebuke that's biblical and oriented around scripture versus just a preference, right? So somebody comes to me and says, your shirt is ugly. You should never wear that again. That's not really a rebuke, right? They just have a preference. The Bible doesn't say that aqua blue, whatever color my shirt is, is, is the wrong color to wear that I should only wear a white shirt. Uh, it's just not in there, right? So what we need to recognize is scripture is the absolute truth and the foundation by which uh, we need to build any kind of rebuke or reproof on that which we hear from others and that which we give lovingly to one another. So let's go to a passage. If, uh, if, you, have, um, if you have been to Awana before, you'll know this passage, right? 2 Timothy 3, 16 through 17, it says this, All scripture is breathed out by God and is profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, equipped for every good work. Now, it's interesting. When we look at this passage, we like the part that we're like, yeah, the Bible's profitable for teaching. Woo! But then look at the next two. For reproof, it's another way to say rebuke, and correction. Ooh. Okay. So, God's word is actually geared to help us know when we need to reset the way we're living because it's not consistent with the holiness of God, with his perfect nature. That's what God's word is is geared for. And the end game there is that we may be complete and equipped for every good work. And so God's word is a really crucial tool in that process of us being rebuked. So scripture is absolute. It isn't preference, right? So if somebody, if you want to come to somebody and say, you know, hey, I don't like how your hair's cut. That, that's not, the Bible's not telling us what the length of your hair should be, right? Or other things maybe that can fall into the realm of preference. But the Bible does speak to the heart issues and the principles like modesty, um, like making Jesus the main attraction and not us and pointing people to him and not to us. That's really what we talk about with bow for the four priorities of our church, that we would be pointing, making everything about Jesus and putting the spotlight on him. So scripture is absolute and a loving rebu- rebuke needs to be oriented around a clear biblical principle, not a personal preference. The other thing that we see is that a loving rebuke is about us when we're not living in a way that's consistent with God's word. It's a time where you look and say, hey, what you're doing doesn't line up with what the Bible says. And I care a lot about you. And I know that you want to become more like Jesus. So reproof and correction are one of the ways that the Bible is intended to help us to be more like Jesus. So now I want to get practical. And I want to talk about seven steps to giving a rebuke, uh, a kind and effective, or in this case, I want to call giving the gift of rebuke seven different steps to guide you. So here's the first one. Check your own heart first. We are often able to see the subtle sin in others because it is, it resonates in our own hearts in a bigger way. So you may be more apt to see pride in other people if pride is something you struggle with. I may be more apt to see a lack of self-control in someone else if uh, self-control is something in my own heart that I struggle with. And so we really need to apply Matthew 7, 5 to this first, where Jesus says, hey, remove the speck, or sorry, remove the log from your own eye. That way you can remove the speck from your brother's eye. 
It starts with us assessing our own sin and having a right posture. We also need to recognize the need for humility in approaching rebuking someone else. That we shouldn't come as uh, out of a desire to show somebody how we're right and how they're wrong, but recognizing the own the sin that we struggle with in our own hearts, and recognizing that we are a greater debtor against God because of our sin than anybody else. And if we have that kind of a posture it will give us the right heart attitude to approach somebody in a loving way. Second step is to seek to sympathize or to empathize with others. What do I mean by that? Well, if you see somebody who has a sin that in their life going on that you've struggled with as well, this is a great time to say, look, I understand how difficult this is. I struggle with this too in my own life. And because I care about you, I want to approach you about this. You're not going to condemn You're not going to put down. You're not going to pass judgment on somebody. You're coming out of a a desire to love and to care for that person. Oftentimes, the one that's more difficult is empathizing. You ever have somebody around you that struggles with a sin? You're like, that's stupid. I don't even struggle with that. Like, really, that's an issue for you? Are you so immature? But those are the moments where we need to ask God to help us to put ourselves in someone else's shoes, to think the way that they think and to empathize with what they're going through. The uh, third step, pray for restoration, to pray for restoration. The purpose of rebuke isn't just to be right. It's not about us sitting in justice and telling somebody else where they're wrong and why we're better than them, but it's about seeing our brother or sister become more like Jesus. It's not about justice. It's about seeing them restored to right relationship with God. And so we need to pray that God would do this work in their heart. It's not something we can do. In coming to, to offer a loving rebuke or giving the gift of rebuke to somebody, we can't change their heart. Only God can. And so we need to, we need to constantly make prayer a crucial part, not only of our approach and our attitude, but um, our whole interaction with that person. The other thing is we need to be quick. The, the fourth thing is we need to be quick. We need to make it a regular thing to approach sin when we see it, to not let it fester, and if at all possible, to deal with it before the sun goes down. You know, it's easy for us to just kind of let things build up and build up and build up, and then boom, it becomes a big issue and we talk about it. The Bible tells us that we should be rebuking or uh, um, admonishing each other every day as long as we're able, right? It is this constant ongoing that we want to pull these weeds of sin out of our life before they become big, nasty plants. Get them while they're small. And if we're constantly helping grow each other in that way and encouraging each other in that way, focused on becoming more like Jesus, that will make a big difference. The fifth thing is, then a fifth step is to be kind. 2 Timothy 2, 24 through 25, this is what Paul tells young Timothy. He says, the Lord's servant must be kind to everyone, then further on down the verse, he says, correcting his opponents with gentleness. We need to be gentle. But in that gentleness, we don't want to lose our directness. We need to have a firm hold on what the truth is and be clear with that. Um, but we need to speak the truth with grace and with love. The sixth point, we need to be clear and be specific. Get it right in your own mind first and be settled on it. Um, You know, I have many times gone through and tried to articulate something to someone without actually settling the matter in my own mind. And by the time I'm done, the other person's like, what are you talking about? You're talking in circles, right? And so it's really important for us to have absolute and clear things in our mind that we see, even some specifics that we can help with, but to make sure that those specifics point back to biblical principles, right? That it doesn't become a matter of preference, Um, but that those specifics help point to the larger sin issue that's going on that you really care about. The um, eighth thing here, I'm sorry, the seventh thing is to follow up. So, you know, we actually need to make follow up a really important, and there's two different aspects to this. If this person receives your rebuke really well, look for ways that you see them implementing those changes and encourage them in that. Praise them. Hey, it's so exciting to see how God is growing you in this area of your life. And if they don't respond well, you know, oftentimes you may walk away feeling really discouraged that I never want to talk to you again. I'm so angry. How could you be so uh, mean to come and say this about me or whatever it is, right? Um, Look for future opportunities to encourage that person and to express love to them, to let them know that you really want good things for them. And the best thing we can want for each other is to become more like Jesus. So that's a really important one. So all right, I want to give you two discussion questions for today taking all this together, and they really kind of build on each other. Here's the first one. What is one area that you desire to grow in regarding receiving correction and rebuke? 
How do you want to grow? What's an area you know, man, I'm deficient in this area. And what's one place that you want to grow in? The second question is this, what's one area that you desire to grow in regarding giving correction and rebuke, right? So it's really the same question. The first part is where do you need to grow in receiving it? And where do you need to grow in giving it? So I'd encourage you to take some time, talk about those questions together as a family, maybe with parents and teens, you guys talk together about this or um, together in a group chat with some of your friends. How can you grow in applying these truths in your lives? Thanks guys for joining me.